in my talk today, I will be talking about how I imagine the stylometry of motion to th that it could develop in the future. I will also be talking about some small scale experiments and uh, some more interesting things that are in the horizon. So let me uh, let, let me share my screen so this makes a bit more more sense. So I'm uh, okay and. Uh, Okay, so hopefully you can see what I'm seeing now. So uh, 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 perhaps uh, Joanna or uh, Matthias, could you confirm that you can see the screen? Yes, that's fairly visible. Yeah, okay, fine. Visible. okay. excellent. Great, yeah, thank you. So, so uh, let me just uh, you know, jump right into and give you an overview. These are the things that I'll uh, talk about in, in this you know, uh, uh, brief overview for the next uh, uh, half an hour or so. So I want to begin by explaining some of the motivations and theoretical considerations for why we need a stylometry of motion in the first place. I will describe two small scale studies that I've done with my collaborators, who are people who work in uh, science and engineering fields. I'll refer to other work, and then I'll spend a bit of time describing the computational future. So the kinds of projects that, I, that, I, that I've done, and as you'll see, uh, work on slightly uh, at a smaller scale in terms of data, and they also use uh, they, they process motion in a, in a simpler way uh, as opposed to the computational technology that is just in the horizon. And then I'll end by sharing with all of you a wish list for motion stylometry. And what I hope to do as well is after this talk to have a conversation with the people who are present here to think also about how we can learn in the stylometry of motion for peop from people who've done uh, related work for the stylometry of text and to see also what are some of the uh, differences and similarities. So in, in terms of you know, just this definition to get it out of the way, there are possible ways in which you could understand uh, motion stylometry. Provisionally, I just want to define it as comparing patterns of motion across different scales and categories. So to give you examples of what this might be, we can, we can compare uh, patterns of motion between individual performers also within a performance. So you can imagine that there are segments of a, a specific uh, performance that has motion, either a theater performance or a dance performance. So you can uh, compare some features of the motion throughout those segments or across a career of, of an individual performer. Uh, also across uh, traditions, genres, schools, and perhaps more interestingly, but more ambitiously, also across geographies and time. So really the dream for motion stylometry is to at some point be able to trace networks of influence. So these networks can be geographical, genealogical or informational. So uh, for example, in, in many cases, so uh, Southeast Asia, which is where, where I'm based, but also elsewhere in Asia, there are very uh, important movement traditions of dance and uh, physical theater a theater with objects, uh, masks, puppets, and other, other kinds of performing objects that share some similarities with their neighbors. So you could think of that as almost akin to contact linguistics where you can see how certain features of language move across neighboring regions. And that's uh, uh, true for, for dance as well, although it hasn't really been tracked uh, with large scale data sets and with the kinds of you know, empirical uh, uh, perspective that uh, data can bring. There are also these genealogical networks of influence. So in many places, people train under specific teachers. And sometimes you have like different schools of, of performance. So this is very uh, important in certain areas of, of uh, Southeast Asia, but also in East Asia, for example, in Japan, for uh, uh, Kapuki and No traditional theater, you have you know, genealogies of performances that can go back you know, uh, 12 generations, 15 generations. And they have particular ways of interpreting certain motions and you can identify if you are familiar with those traditions, somebody as belonging to, to one uh, uh, school or, or another. But also now we have this informational flow through the network. So as we uh, uh, you know, are sharing more of our lives online because of the uh, pandemic, but also in recent history through social media, a lot of people are sharing movement-based art with one another and they are copying each other, deriving inspiration. So 
uh, if we were able to, to trace these networks of influence, we could ask questions such as, you know, which aspects of, of dance or of you know, motion-based uh, theater change more quickly? And th this could be something simpler, like, you know, is it the, the motions of the, like, the upper limbs or is it things of the, of the head? Or, you know, you could also think of it as specific sequences of things. So uh, certain sequences of motions that get adopted from one place to the other. Uh, we could also ask questions such as, you know, which types of motion are more likely to spread to other places? So is there something inherent to certain features of these motions that they make them more likely to be copied by other places? Or what kinds of contexts, you know, institutional, informational, or, uh, you know, geographical that facilitate faster or slower change? So that's really kind of the, the, the dream and where I hope we could, uh, uh, that, that we can make some progress towards. Uh, why do we want this? So uh, this follows up from what, what I said before. So, so I think that we can have a better understanding of the performing arts, its history, maybe not uh, too far back in time. We don't have the benefit of you know, uh, uh, hundreds of years of videos and other kinds of, of records of motion as people do for texts, although there are some you know, notations and other kinds of things that we could use for a stylometry of motion. But also like the perhaps the most interesting thing is the shape of current practice. And this is interesting not only for the more, more established performing arts, so I, I'm, I'm interested in, in the uh, performing arts of Southeast Asia primarily, but also uh, increasingly, for example, my students are interested in movement-based popular culture and social media behaviors. So for example, one of my students is uh, looking at uh, cover dance. So uh, you know, probably this is not uh, something that is such an important phenomenon in, in Poland and elsewhere. But uh, over here, uh, young people are, are fascinated by K-pop, like K-pop dance, you know, Korean pop. And also there are all these videos of people on YouTube doing covers of these uh, 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 famous K-pop dance performances. So you can see just this cursory search for videos on Google renders 26 million videos of K-pop cover dance. And you can see also there are cover dance festivals. So there are plenty of, of things out there. And you could also ask the same kinds of questions about how certain uh, features of motion spread throughout these uh, informational networks and how that's different uh, uh, in other places. So for example, one of the things that, that my student would be looking at is how uh, you know, people who are based say in uh, Myanmar or Indonesia or Malaysia, you know, are they all doing the same kinds of, of cover dance or are they doing different things? Uh, so, so these are the reasons why I think it, it's interesting to invest time and effort in developing techniques and archives for uh, stylometry of motion. So uh, just to get this out of the way, the last you know, more theoretical thing I'll say is that representing motion as data is always an interpretive thing and it comes with its own set of complications. So I distinguish between three levels that we can have for representing motion as digital data. So one would be to use concepts that have been introduced er earlier. So these you know, conceptual descriptions of, of motion could be something like uh, Laban uh, uh, motion analysis. So I don't know if you can see it here on this diagram here, but uh, 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 the Laban motion analysis is, is a vocabulary for describing motions in terms of space uh, 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 body and effort and shape, so across these uh, dimensions. So people can use this to describe a variety of movements. And this has been applied to the performing arts, but also to how people interact with robots, for example. So there's a big area of research at uh, you know, human computer interaction or, robot, or uh, human robot interaction that people use uh, uh, LMA to, to, to describe motions. And that, 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 that's um, standard vocabulary that can be represented uh, symbolically in a computer. We also have notations. So this is an example here of Laban notation, which you know, is different from Laban motion analysis. This is uh, uh, just a way of representing like limbs uh, uh, and uh, uh, patterns of motion and speed. Uh, and it's a way of transcribing dance. Uh, this is the most uh, used notation system today, but there are some historical precedents that in the case of Europe go back a few centuries and also uh, today there's the Banesh movement notation, but that's perhaps less, less common. And the third level would be numerical data. So this could be representations of level one or two, or something that is a bit more agnostic. That means that you can try to identify patterns in a video or in a motion capture data without taking into account 
you know, does it correspond to any specific uh, concept or any specific notation? So I'm going to be speaking mostly about this third level today, but I just want to uh, note that it's also possible to reconstruct digital data from these uh, conceptual descriptions or from notations. And you know, even though this is agnostic, there, there's always interpretation baked into the, into the way in which we choose to pay attention to certain things and not others. So now let me describe briefly these two studies. And both of these are based in study station in Indonesia, because that's the area that I'm working on. But I hope that this is, uh, that you, uh, those in the audience can see similarities with other kinds of traditions, other kinds of perspectives that are not necessarily so culturally specific. So I won't go into a lot of the details. I'll, I'll just try to explain this in very general terms so that we can establish some uh, uh, basis for potential expansion into other fields. So in this first study, I'm going to describe what we can do with low level video features alone. There are plenty of more complex things that we can do. And I'll get into that later on in this talk, but even thinking of very low level features, this can be quite informative and can guide uh, an analytical project. So the project that I'm going to describe is uh, based on Wayankulit, which is a form of shadow puppetry in Java, Indonesia. Uh, puppetry has other kinds of connotations in other parts of the world. Here in, in, in Java, it's the most important artistic form. So it has an extremely long history. It's very prestigious. And it's something that is aimed at uh, people from all ages, uh, from uh, all walks of life. So I could spend a lot of time talking about this tradition. I want, I just want to show you this image without saying too much about it, except that this is a slightly modern rendition of this very old tradition and these uh, uh, characters and histories that have uh, documented history that goes back at least 1,000 years. So what, what I want to do now is just to show you this uh, frame from a video recording. One advantage of using something like uh, shadow puppetry is that you can record this from the side of the, of the shadows. And then it's very easy to obtain movement data, uh, low level movement data from these kind of recordings. But we can do the same thing for other uh, types of, of theater as I'll explain in a moment. But what I want to show you now is something called the difference image. So this is one frame from the video. And now I press enter and hopefully you can see the next image. So you can see that the hand moved. So let me try that again. Hopefully that works on Zoom. So uh, I'm just doing a couple more times. So you can see that the only difference between these two contiguous frames is that this arm uh, uh, changed. So what we can do is then we can create this difference image. So basically we subtract uh, from this uh, 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 matrix of pixels. So as, as you know, the, the pixels, the, the video is represented, sorry, as, as, as a matrix of, of pixels where we could have uh, values in you know, red, green, and blue uh, that go between say you know zero and, and 255 uh, and, and we can convert that to uh, gray values if we don't care about colors uh, and the subtract it so, so basically you can see what is the difference between what you see in one frame and the next frame and here this is the image that emerges so then we can count the number of pixels that have a difference so the number of pixels that change between one frame and the next so the number of pixels in this uh, difference image and then we can plot that as a graph. Uh, so here you can see that represented as a function of time. And you can see, uh, so here on the, uh, the uh, vertical axis, you can see the number of non-identical pixels. And here you see time. So this is a slightly short uh, uh, performance, but sometimes uh, 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 they can go for much longer. And what you can see here is that, you know, the amount of movement is not the same throughout the entire performance, but there are certain moments with mode more movement than others. So this is a, a proxy for the amount of movement, the amount of speed that, that uh, sorry, the amount of movement, and in some cases also the speed of motion within a, a, a particular uh, uh, moment of the performance. And this is this approach has also been used by people like uh, Lev Manovic, for example, for analyzing films. So he's done a, a famous project analyzing the, the uh, films of uh, Siga Vertov for example, using image difference. 
The advantage of this is that it's very easy to implement. It makes sense for cases where you have, uh, for the case of theater as opposed to film, when you have a single camera. And you have that in the case of shadow puppetry, but also in many cases for rehearsal. So rehearsal footage that is often taken is excellent for this because the camera doesn't move around. Uh, there is no expressive meaning to the, to the camera as opposed to film. We just wanted to have it in a, in a specific location and not move uh, throughout an entire uh, rehearsal, for example. And then we can see these differences throughout time. We can also then uh, compare different kinds of scenes throughout a performance. So we were interested in then using that to compare uh, different types of scenes. So uh, I won't go into the details, but in this tradition, you have certain kinds of themes. So, so you have like uh, 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 what we call normal scenes, uh, also narrative scenes, uh, comic scenes. And one uh, innovation of this specific performance was uh, frame scene. And you can see here, we're comparing the standard deviation of the number of non-identical pixels against the mean for each of those scenes. And you can see that this lends itself nicely to a, a classification. So for example, you can see that the narrative scenes uh, tend to have a higher mean value for the number of non-identical pixels, but also like a higher standard deviation. So one way to think about that is that in these kinds of scenes, you, they tend to be faster. There tends to be like a lot more motion on average, but also they tend to be more uh, diverse than the entire scene. So since the standard deviation is, is higher, that also means that you have a combination of things that are faster and slower within that scene. So even though this gives you a very simplistic approximation, the advantage is that it's easy to, to implement and it's easy to interpret. Let me move on to the second study, which in this case, uh, we used biomechanics uh, and we used an optical uh, motion capture system for the uh, biomechanics of dance. And this was a collaboration between people who work in the biomechanics of sports and uh, dancers from Indonesia. So I uh, brought everyone together for a workshop that we did uh, here in Singapore. And the idea was to find out to what extent could we use the standard toolkit that people use for the biomechanical analysis of sports to study uh, uh, dance. And one thing that we did here is we looked at the idea of character types. So character types might sound rather uh, obscure uh, as a concept if you're not familiar with the traditions of Asia in general. So almost everywhere in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in East Asia, for movement-based traditions, you have what's called character types. So they're different in different places, but for example, you have characters that are you know, uh, ogres or like the uh, refined characters, and you have the refined but uh, braver character and all sorts of divisions that are incredibly important for the appreciation of these performances. Some people even suggest that this is more important than actually the development of plot. So things like uh, uh, plot are, is not as important in these movement traditions because people are familiar with the stories, but the specific ways in which the conventions for character types are used is, is important. Now, perhaps one, the, the, the closest thing to this in the, the European tradition would be perhaps the Comedia del Arte, where you have you know, certain character types, certain you know, stock characters that also have certain patterns of motion and speech. In this case, uh, the, there are patterns of also like you know, uh, costume and uh, for the traditions that use speech, we have that as well. Here we selected a tradition called Sendatari Ramayana that uses only motion. There's no um, uh, 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 spoken text in this case. And uh, well, basically you have these uh, you know, four character types for this initial study. We uh, uh, looked at the male uh, uh, dancers, but you also have like, you know, female dancers. So you know, initially it's uh, uh, divided along those lines. So anyways, you have uh, you know, just uh, uh, briefly, you have you know, four different character types that are, are located theoretically along these uh, axes. So you have like you know, strong and refined and humble and proud. So you know, uh, this uh, like, uh, type of motion here is like strong and humble. And uh, that, that's kind of like the traditional way to think about these, these uh, dances. But we've also got a newer addition that this only started later in the, in the 20th century. So we wanted to know this kind of character. Uh, so this is not, not so much a, a, a character type, but a specific character that represents, as you can see here, a, a bird-like figure. You know, where would it fit within this uh, quadrant? So we extracted a bunch of uh, measurements, uh, 
uh, through these optical markers. And we also had like uh, sensors for muscle activity and these sensors on the floor. I don't know if you can see here, this is a, a diagram, but it, it's a little bit uh, in high resolution here. So this is the position of different uh, optical markers and these uh, uh, force plates that we've got on the floor. And then we have this uh, uh, page on, uh, uh, online that you, it, it's really available. And you can see for, uh, this is an example. Where, so in the example that we have here on this uh, website, we have one motion. So let me just play this and hopefully you can see this. So we asked uh, uh, dancers to repeat the exact same motion. So this is, uh, has a specific name, this uh, uh, standing up motion, but according to the different character types. So let, let me show you uh, a different one. So, so you can see the, so here it's standing up, but it's standing up in a slightly different way. And here you can see some images with the costume, but the advantage of, of using the markers is that you can, you don't get distracted by the costume and other kinds of, of conventions. You look entirely at what the body is doing. And on this online platform, you can also uh, go to the, to the graph. So it's interactive as I'm putting my mouse over the graph it immediately goes to the, to the uh, uh, part of the video that corresponds to this graph. So in this case, I'm looking at the left knee on the X plane and you can select any combination of the different, uh, uh, so for example, the, the, the uh, right elbow on the X plane. And here you can see that there's a, a peak and uh, uh, a lower peak over here. And if I click, you can see it over there. So uh, one, uh, one interesting thing about this is that for example, here, uh, this is the moment of greatest uh, flexion for this, uh, the angle of the right elbow. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of what that means, but the point is that you can see certain things that otherwise would be hard to, to perceive. And uh, uh, for example, sometimes you have these small adjustments, like the curve wiggles a little bit. That is something that's hard to see sometimes with the naked eye, but these things are important for the way in which different character types are uh, represented on stage. Uh, you know, this website is available on uh, online. We've got also like all the all the code on GitHub in case anybody wants to use it and all the uh, data is available for download uh, in case anybody wants to reproduce our results or combine them with another data set. So this, you know, provides you with an initial exploration of uh, at this level of detail of these different characters. But we were also interested in, in you know, comparing uh, these motions. So. Uh, for this initial study, what we, we, we found that the, the root mean square uh, allowed us to reproduce the distinctions that we uh, already knew and then extend this to the one that was new, so to, to the character that we are uh, interested in, in exploring. And then uh, basically what we, what, what we did is we, we uh, applied this measurement, uh, uh, scaled to all the different uh, joints of the body, and then looked at how much different uh, how much this character was pulled in different uh, directions towards these different, you know, the humble, proud, refined, or strong. And some of the inspiration for this was to try to think about what we mean to apply, uh, you know, to, to come up with a measurement, such as the kinds of things that you have in textual stylometry, say like you have like Burroughs Delta, uh, and then what would mean to have like this easy to interpret difference between motions. So that, that, that was our, our initial uh, intention here. And one thing that we found though, is that this is uh, inconclusive. W w one interesting thing is that Jatayu is actually being simultaneously pulled uh, in, in different directions to these different quadrants. So in some ways it's, it's closer to the strong and humble, but it's, it still has elements from all the other uh, movement types, uh, all the other character types. So e even though that, the specific conclusions of that study are perhaps not um, incredibly impressive. What we think is that this uh, shows a way of thinking about motion and ask the question of, you know, what would it mean to develop standardized measurements for similarity and classification? And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, coming up with these measurements can really push the discipline forward and answer all sorts of interesting questions about historical change and geographical diversity. But let me uh, talk about other approaches briefly. Uh, there are many other interesting things that we can do. There's, uh, so this is something that I find particularly exciting as an idea and it's something that we are trying to do now for, the, for a new um, 
uh, uh, project. So here we, we're inspired by, by a relatively old paper uh, uh, by uh, uh, Hachimura and his collaborators. So this is a group in Japan that they've done a lot of things, for example, converting from lab annotation that I mentioned at the beginning into numerical data. So they do uh, motion capture from lab annotation. And then one of the things that they do to answer this question of how do you compare motions is that what they, they uh, so, so they're interested from, in the case of Japan, uh, there are these specific motions of the feet. So this is like for, for uh, uh, no theater. So those of you who have seen it, like, you know, there's a specific way of moving the feet uh, that is uh, very slow at first and then very fast. And you want to, uh, so, so they were interested in identifying those motions. But one tricky thing of using things like what I uh, uh, showed earlier is that that depends if you start with the left side of the body or the right side of the body. So they wanted something that was more robust to those kinds of differences. And what they did was they, they, they came up with this, uh, they applied this uh, uh, measurement of uh, minimum convex uh, polyhedron, sometimes called a uh, convex hull. So uh, this is basically, uh, as you can see in this diagram from their paper, what they do is for each joint of the body, they uh, create a plane between all of these. So they create like different, uh, you know, uh, uh, planes between these different joints. So you have this minimum space that captures the amount of movement at a particular pose. So, so at any moment in time, so you can think of like, you know, you are putting the, 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 the dancer, the performer inside this polyhedron that has like the, the, the minimum uh, possible uh, uh, volume. So, so then in some ways, it doesn't matter if the left foot is first or the right foot is, is first because the actual volume of this minimum shape that captures the, the totality of the motion is always the same. And then they, they, they plot that also over time. One interesting thing about this is that it's another way to compare also, uh, you know, the things that I was pointing at uh, before, like, you know, the things like, you know, speed and variety of movement. Uh, and this is also independent of displacement over, over space. So in some ways, it's uh, the, the one problem of using the image difference is that, you know, if the uh, dancers move a, a lot across the space, but they're you know, upper limbs are almost static, that would still show up as a lot of motion. Whereas as in the case of say like, you know, Japanese theater where you know, the, kind of like the, the uh, upper uh, uh, part of the body is almost the same, uh, but so there's very little uh, movement, but there's translation over space. You will be able to capture that with this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, polyhedron. And this has also been uh, applied in other contexts. Uh, uh, for example, this is uh, a project from a motion bank so the kinds of visualizations they do here are more uh, interpretive and artistic. Uh, 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 this is a fascinating project, by the way, I completely recommend to those who are interested in looking at this. So they looked at six choreographers that are influential in, in, the, in, uh, in Europe. So this is like contemporary uh, dance uh, uh, choreographers and they found ways to visualize the different uh, 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 features of their work. So in the case of Deborah Hay, she has a, a particular approach to choreography where the, the, there are certain things of the dance that should change every time it's interpreted by a different person. So one thing that they did here is that they used also like a, this, uh, like, you know, uh, 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 so, so uh, this is a minimum convex polygon. So it's, it's similar to the polyhedron, except it's uh, two dimensional. So you can see that this is like seen from above. So you can imagine that it's like a bird's eye view and what each of these shapes shows is how much the, uh, a particular dancer moved over the, uh, over the space. So these are you know, different performers that interpreted the same dance, but in completely different ways. And this is one way in which you can see that. Uh, so uh, the reason why I'm showing this is because I want to stress that sometimes we need to also think about what are the specific movement traditions, the specific vocabularies, metaphors that make sense within a tradition and not just you know, copy the same measurements from one place to the other. But even providing for those differences, you can see that for the case of you know, traditional uh, Japanese theater or you know, contemporary choreography in Europe, some adaptation of the same technique can show something interesting uh, depending on what the question is. So uh, let me now just briefly, as I move towards the conclusion of this talk, outline some really interesting projects that are on the horizon. So a bunch of teams have worked on uh, motion capture from video. And many of these things are available. The code is available and it works to an incredible level of accuracy. 
So this is, for example, one uh, a project that works even with uh, direct video. So from a webcam, uh, you can see their live demo in their website and, and it can capture the shape of the body of a performer and even some nuances of the hand gestures, you know, for the sake of like, you know, playing an instrument uh, or uh, assembling uh, an object on a table. So this would be, for example, enough to, if you wanted to do the, uh, this tracking, like, you know, motion over time, or like this, like, you know, minimum convex polyhedron that I showed with this kind of, of uh, products that, that would be possible. And this is not the only a project that works on this kind of transfer from video to motion capture. We also have some people that are working on like skeleton from video. So this is really interesting if you want to do other kinds of uh, biomechanical analysis. So for example, like, you know, angular velocity and uh, which is one of the things that we also looked in at our other project. You can do this now with video. So the problem of using uh, the problem of using um, Optical markers is that it's an expensive technology, and there are less labs now that are that are uh, that have those kinds of, of technologies. But with video, you can it, 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 it's 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 uh, it's amazing. You can even tell apart between uh, different people. So even when you have other people in the background, you you can still uh, estimate this from a single uh, figure. And then uh, uh, open pose is also a, a, an, an incredible project. That as you can see in this in this demo, it, it can estimate like you know the position of different uh, uh, parts of the, of, of the face, uh, individual fingers, and uh, you know the position of the limbs, and uh, it can also do it in uh, uh, with uh, live video. But of course, it works even better if you have recorded video that you can uh, uh, then input into their into their system. So to bring this to a close, I want to talk about what is what I understand to be a wish list for the stylometry of, of motion. So I believe that what we need at this stage is really like a collection of theater and dance videos. And again, you know, making a reference to the uh, incredible advances in the stylometry of texts. One of the reasons why those advances were possible was because researchers had access to a shared uh, collection of corpora that were in standard formats and that people could apply and test different measurements against the same corpora. So that's one of the things that we would love to have for this project to advance. So we need a collection of theater and dance videos. Before, when I started the project that I showed you, uh, we invested a lot of time on the motion capture projects, but now we know that video is really the, the way to go, that the level of precision, at least for the kinds of questions that we have, is sufficient with video. And the only things that we need for the video is full body shots. Of course, the video works as you, when you have, uh, you know, just a portion of somebody's body, like, you know, just like the, the, the limbs of the face, but for the kind of stylometric comparisons that we want, we really want to have like, you know, full body shots. Uh, but that's really the only real requirement. In, in terms of the video. Uh, the camera can be shaky, the quality can be very low, the, there can be uh, a lot of noise in the video, there can be other people, there can be many other things happening, and all of that can be easily removed with these new tools. The other thing that we need is for this to be open access so that other people can validate their methods against the same standard set of, of, of videos. We need metadata, and ideally annotation. But I think the more we have open access, the more we would have also people annotating a specific motions, specific segments of a video. And then you can start doing more interesting uh, uh, sorts of, of things. So for example, using a, a supervised machine learning to uh, estimate uh, similarities between different motions in a way that doesn't rely on these very uh, uh, simplistic uh, models like the ones I, I showed before. So the more you have access to these kinds of things, especially if you had some labels, then uh, that uh, there are so many things that you could do with, uh, with, with machine learning. So things that I thought we needed uh, a few years ago, but they're not necessary anymore, like you know, stable camera position, 
uh, no light changes and high resolution. That was important for the first project if you wanted to use the image difference, because if, you, if the camera changes, if the light changes, if you don't have high resolution, all of that uh, uh, creates noise that you can remove, but it's, it's a lot harder. But now with these new projects, the only thing that you need is the videos. So we need people uh, who are interested in this in, in schools and in institutions, maybe in theater venues to collect and share these videos. And the homework for motion telemetry is, is to uh, work towards the systematic analysis of measurements for classification and similarity. So to really understand in a more comprehensive and systematic way, what different measurements enable and how they can be used for the analysis of more complex uh, questions. So with that, I, I, I want to end this presentation and uh, I look forward to any questions or discussions from the participants. So thank you very much.